Episode 161 of the TV Dudes Podcast, recorded December 7th, 2017, Hipster Bullshit. bullshit yeah randy you came up with this title this I, week. and i came out because i was watching search party after we, i was watching easy uh actually no i was first i was watching um she's gotta have it which is all in brooklyn uh-huh. and full hipster bullshit and and then i started watching uh, search party which is also in brooklyn <laughs> and full of hipster bullshit and I, had, bullshit, and I knew when I got to Easy because I watched first season, first season that there was hipster bullshit. And I'm like, yeah, we, we, we somehow accidentally themed for hipster bullshit. And then we're, we were supposed to watch Dark on Netflix, but uh, sorry, Les, I failed at my homework assignment, did not get a chance to watch it. Oh, man. I started a little bit of Dark. I didn't know that was on our homework. Is, but... there, is there any hipster bullshit in it? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I wouldn't really. I mean, it's German. Uh, I'm three episodes <laughs> in, and, and no. I believe they call it hipster shiza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we are going to be talking about a slew of shows this week, folks. We're going to be talking about, like Randy said, Easy, Search Party, and She's Gotta Have It. But we're also going to be jumping over to Crisis on Earth X, which is the big multi-show crossover Berlanti Flash Arrowverse event DC. I don't know what to call it. I don't know. I just can't see how many words you get thrown at it. Yeah, I started running out of breath. <laughs> yeah, it's Crisis on Earth X. It's the four part crossover between Supergirl, Arrow, Flash, and Legends of Tomorrow. And it's all of them punching Nazis. There's no hipster bullshit in it, but there's Nazis. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I haven't watched it, so I'm more excited about the other shows, obviously. But, folks, before we get into all that, we are the TV dudes. I'm Grant. I'm Randy. I'm Les. And Les is uh, recording with us over Skype, so if he it sounds terrible, we're just going to cut him out, and you guys won't have to listen to him. We're just, true. We're just going to drop him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Les. <laughs> I know that's harsh. Uh uh, we want to say, hey, guys, if you want to help support us, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can go to iTunes, give a five-star rating, write a little bit of a review. We appreciate that. We'll read that on the show. You can also go to patreon.com slash TV dudes and make a per episode pledge. Give us a buck or two per episode. If you like what you're hearing and you just want to you want to help us out, you want us to continue to grow and do other projects. For example, the Good Die Young project, which Les is currently running over on um, – on the good Di- the good die young TV dot com, it's the newest spinoff project. Let's tell I'm a big us fan about of that one. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> so uh, after uh, being inspired by what Randy did uh, and, and you did with uh, Beach Cop Detectives about terriers, I uh, I decided to do a deep dive podcast and chose the Middleman. Uh, but I'm planning on keeping it going and doing more one season wonder. Uh, one and done kind of shows but right now i'm going through a season of deep diving into the the middleman the abc family show that i'm geeked out about before on here and uh got a bunch of interviews with the cast and crawling through the episodes it's been great yeah you're about uh you're on episode four i believe yeah episode four just released this past monday and uh interviews with most of the principal cast so far uh javier grio marx watch the creator and natalie morales uh and matt keesler the two leads and then uh, I've also got an interview up with Mary Pat Gleason, who plays Ida, the android on the show. Awesome, yeah. awesome, and and I've I've really been enjoying it. I uh, I listen to this podcast, even though it is produced by a friend of mine. That's the highest praise I can give because I don't listen to all my friends' podcasts, but I listen to this one. That's fair. You said the exact same thing about my Star Trek one. Yeah, but I was lying about that. No, that's not true. I listen you to that listen too. You listen to all of our podcasts, and then you try to claim you don't listen to podcasts, so it's those, a big deal, your those, opinion. Those are literally the only two I listen to. It's not a big deal I, anymore, your opinion. I now. don't listen to the beerists. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Let's jump over to some listener questions. So if you guys like us on Facebook once a week, Randy puts out the post about questions that you can ask us pretty much anything. Michael Cassini has the first one. He says, hello, dudes. So now that Netflix has as many superhero shows as the CW, what do you think? Who do you think is doing it better? My answer is FX with Legion. But for the sake of the question, let's just ignore that station and that fact. So what do you guys think? 
CW or Netflix? Less CW. I agree. Really? Yeah. Um, the The thing about Netflix shows is they have a they have a tonal similarity, and there there's real pacing issues with all of them. Even the best of them, like Daredevil and and um, I guess I guess Punisher maybe or or Jessica Jones, they all have pacing issues. They all seem a little bit embarrassed by the source material. They don't seem as as ambitious. The CW stuff may be cheesy. In fact, it, it definitely is cheesy, and they steer into it deliberately. But they are not embarrassed by the source material, and they take big swings. I mean, they had Firestorm. They have a time ship. They did a whole a whole crossover about them fighting the evil Earth X Nazis. I mean, that's crazy shit. And to to do it, yeah, they go big. Yeah. And I'm honestly, I'm really looking forward to uh, the Arrowverse minus Andrew Kreisberg. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I don't know. I I find it so cheesy every time I see it, but I I guess because I hate so much of what Netflix does, I'll also <laughs> give it to the CW. When it comes to comic book properties, I I find that I will I will take airing on the side of shiny uh, over Netflix's like trudging through some of this. Like, why is there always a point in the Netflix show where where I go? Oh God! This is the two episodes where this just stops. Yeah, yeah. And well, I say that I say always, but then they shortened Defenders, and that was just a clusterfuck. Like that, that was just so so bad to watch. I yeah, mean, I, I don't know. They've gotten so much less fun. Like with every single one of them being so tonally similar, I can't believe how Netflix like took something I liked and just like drove it into the ground for me. Same. Yeah. I I just feel like. The X Men shows I've seen are all better. Yeah, agreed. Legion, Runaways is Runaways kind of X Men. It's got mutant in it. It's got a mutant, know. but yeah, maybe. And then The Gifted. Uh, I was kind of letting the X Men have it since they have a mutant. Sure, fair enough. <laughs> and, and it's actually kind of good. But if we're, I mean, the thing is, if you want to go on quantity, then you got to give it to, to Fox because they had two shows. They have Gifted and Legion, and Legion is the pinnacle. But uh, yeah. Runaways is really, really good, and Hulu is showing signs of of really doing some great stuff. So if they get another superhero show, they could take the lead. Yeah, we'll see. Looking forward to seeing what Freeform does with Cloak and Dagger and uh, and where the next few properties go. Me too. <laughs> it's Freeform, though. I feel like <laughs> I've already written it off. Um, that's my bias. Uh, all right. Marvin Lanier says, what up, dudes? So I have a be- I have begrudgingly started a Hulu subscription after years of avoiding it because in its early days, it was buggy as all get out. I love it, and I think it is now essential. What things have you dudes avoided but discovered that you liked? Brussels sprouts, weirdly. You know, they're like, they're. oh, is it not that kind of question? Anal? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not that kind of question, Grant. We may be off here. I don't know what he might be asking. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, mornings. but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what have we avoided? How about l- let's keep it, you know, concerning TV. To TV. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I learned things I didn't want to know. Yeah. So crazy. You just might work. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm trying to think of like everything that I've avoided. It's, it's usually a uh, thinking about avoiding. Like I wasn't going to get Hulu. And then I did. I wasn't going to watch Discovery. And then I did. Uh, I, I, didn't like reality shows or i didn't think i did as mm-hmm. much for a long time um and then well i mean i i was kind of guilty pleasure watching like american idol or um uh survivor mm-hmm. but i could recognize they weren't really that good and then i started watching top chef i got really into project runway um ter- a terrace house <laughs> I <was really> into <laughs> so i feel like those are the ones where i'm i'm just in denial i tried to pretend i don't like reality tv but man some of those shows are really addictive yeah what about you les i don't know i'm uh, usually i'm pretty sure that i'm gonna like most of this stuff when i sit down <laughs> for it um i would say honestly easy really i resisted sitting down to watch easy and uh because the first season was uneven yeah and uh and I'm only two episodes into, I mean, I'm, I'm not done with obviously this new season of easy, but I am, I was really shocked. Like, uh, I, I generally avoid a lot of the newer, uh, casual catastrophe. Uh, I don't know the half sad sitcoms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and so easy looked like hipster bullshit, half sad mumblecore sitcom. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm really shocked that I'm like, 
I can't wait to watch the rest of the season. Yeah, we'll we'll talk we'll talk about that because I I had a very similar reaction. Uh, jumping to the next question, Dennis McElwain says, "How refreshing is it to see somebody on the outs in the Arrowverse because of illness and not typical CW angst?" Also, also in the Arrowverse. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering that too. <laughs> uh, someone must have gotten sick. Huh? I guess maybe uh, Mocking Jay. That's got, not uh, that's not a character from either universe. Got a tummy flu that's, or something. Nope. Uh, he says, also, Shannara Chronicles is bad and run by the worst offenders of CW angst. Go, Gow and Miller. I don't actually know that's their name. Go and Miller? There, there were guys who worked on uh, Smallville, I believe. Uh, he, also, he also goes on to say, did I mention Shannara Chronicles is bad? Stuck in an elevator with Rob Schneider. Bad. <laughs> I'm guessing Dennis McElwain watches that show. Every single week. Uh -huh. He can't stop. Yep. That's his reality TV. Yeah, you need an intervention, Dennis. <laughs> Just put down the Shannara Chronicles. Yeah. Yeah. So this should have been my answer for the previous one because I fell into the Shannara Chronicle, Shannananan article uh, <laughs> in season one. I think because Dave Faraby uh, had mentioned, like, has anybody watched this? This is weirdly okay. And I I mean, I binged through the, the season of it. Like, it. It's so I mean, it's based on Terry Brooks novels and they're kind of YA and it's got some some cheesy built in. Um, but I, I had a blast with it. Like it's goofball sword and sorcery. And I fucking loved that show. Uh, Dennis is just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what was the question? Something happened to somebody on Arrowverse. That's the only one of these shows that I just can't keep up with. Like Arrow is so just turgidly secretive about everything like i the fact that they got wild duck's costume right is just not enough once ragman was gone uh yeah it, it may be refreshing but it was too late for me to see it yeah uh jonathan huffnagel says dear timey wimey tv dudes i shall soon be devouring episodes of the crown season two otherwise known as a time travel paradox in which doctor who assumes the identity of prince charles and charms yet another queen he says he's ex especially excited for Doctor Who Christmas special this year uh, as it's uh, reuniting the 12th and the 1st Doctor. I didn't know all that. Um, you are no doubt preparing your best of list this year. This year was a rather fresh take for the season and ended with a bunch of great moments. You may have already talked about this earlier in the year, but what are your thoughts about this year's season of Doctor Who? Um, and what are your thoughts about the future of Doctor Who? Are you as excited for the Christmas special and next season as I am? Also, what are your top Doctor Who Christmas specials? I have to pick the day of the Doctor. Uh, my favorite part about this season's Doctor Who was when he fought the Martians in episode seven. I, I don't know if you're making it up or if you're serious. It's po no one can <laughs> confirm this. It's like a John Oliver bit. God, God damn it, Grant! If 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 I'm right, then it sounds like I watched Doctor Who this season. Okay, but you just blew the whole thing. <laughs> my my favorite one was when he faced off Power Rangers style against some crappily made <laughs> bad guy costume, and the whole thing was just wacky. And I felt like I wasted an hour of my life. Was that the one that love solved? <laughs> yeah, love solved that one. Les, what was your favorite episode? I actually, I actually like Doctor Who. I have not watched this past season though. Um, I am really excited for them having a female Doctor. Um, there's a, a lot of the inherent problems on the show just stem from their his his companions always being female, and even they normally don't have any kind of romantic subplot with, but that just leaves them as this weird damsel in distress. He's dragging around a lot, and and it's always been problematic. I'm looking forward to them flipping that this next season um the christmas episodes for me always doctor who is at its worst for me when <laughs> they are trying for big cheese ball giant epic uh stuff it, it's it it kind of shows their hand of like oh god this is hokey and and their christmas specials just aim for that shit so uh they, they usually work least for me i like my favorite doctor who episodes are the small really scary ones um they've had some genuine like really creepy friggin episodes i my favorite christmas special is the one that was a uh, late matt smith one. it might be the last matt smith one where he comes and basically res it's it's sort of lion witch in the wardrobe riff and he rescues the uh the like the widow's uh husband who was in a bomber it's really good i actually really like that one i watched that one every other christmas or so with my kids 
Uh, that is definitely my favorite of them. But I am generally a fan of the Christmas specials, although they do tend to be like interstitial between uh, when they're about to change doctors. It's like a it's like a palate cleanser thing. Or like you say, they're trying to aim kind of big and it doesn't always work. But I, I generally am, I would consider myself a fan in general. And I am I, looking forward to this one just because I like Peter Capaldi and seeing him with uh, the first. I think that'll be a cool blend. And, and I want to see the transition gap between uh, uh, this doctor and uh, I can't think of the actress's name, Jody. Jody something. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to that, too. I'm actually looking forward to the new doctor. I, I was not a big Capaldi fan. It kind of dropped me off the show because I also didn't like Clara very much. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't like the companion he was with. But again, I don't know. I'm. I'm optimistic they've also changed showrunners from the people that that were kind of the worst offenders for me on on some of its indulgences right so right see where it goes yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to it now wasn't there an eccleston one where he fights like some anthropomorphized christmas trees or something dumb uh, uh they weren't christmas were they christmas trees holy shit there might have been yes i was thinking of the guys with like the they were like christmas santa robots but yes there might have been the santa robots but there i think there might have been christmas trees. he might have fought christmas trees that's not out I, of the d- realm of I don't know yeah, Th- that yeah. show whatever more ben rubin says hey tv dudes with netflix's new release of dark the time traveling creepy missing german kids show very good description my question is an age-old question Do you prefer subs or dubs? Also, suggestions for if you ever want to distribute a creepy German show. Don't default to English dubbing. German is already creepy. No need to change it. And you know what? I only watched one episode of this. Les, I believe you watched three. But that was immediately my issue. I I was watching this, and it was like, oh, wait, this is dubbed with, with English. And I know they're not speaking that. I can't. I can't watch them with someone else's bad acting voice in there. Uh, so I switched it immediately and was just reading the whole time. And yeah, it was frustrating because I have to actually really like watch it the whole time so I can read. Yeah, I can't like look at my phone or something while while I'm watching. Can't you? What do your what do your kids can read? Right? Can't can't she read it to you? As just you dictate to me. Yeah. And <laughs> I might as well have the the dub. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, dark. Seems it's pretty kid friendly, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure if you want, they have a uh, with description. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh, jeez. <laughs> You've never turned that on. It's, a, it's, it's entertaining. Um, yeah, I, I watch almost everything with subtitles on anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, and so this wasn't that different for me. But but yeah, I I agree. I actually I had messaged Randy about like, hey, I didn't know that this had finally dropped on Netflix, but I had read a. Th- thing about it in a list of what's coming before the end of the year um because netflix hasn't produced very many foreign language shows um they they did three percent uh, and there's one other one um but uh but i had read about them producing a, a german language show i was under the impression that they weren't going to dub it that like that it was just going to release german with subtitles and deal mm. with it and so i was really shocked when i turned it on and uh everybody looked at comrade detective <laughs> I can't not see it. I mean, if you're not going to make a joke about it, uh, then you can't do it. It's like putting a laugh track on something. It can't just be there. You have to make a meta joke about there being a laugh track. Uh, if you're gonna, <laughs> I can't watch something with with the words not dubbed. Now, the anime or cartoons aren't the same for me. I I can watch the recast American voice actors on like Princess Mononoke and uh, Spirited Away and stuff. Um, but it's because animation's lips don't move as accurately to words. Yeah, it's all lips doesn't jump out to me but i made it through like one scene and went nope and went to the german uh and flipped it back exactly like right as soon as they're at that kitchen table i was like "Uh uh-uh nope gone (laughs) for a while my old hulu used to run all of my commercials in spanish i don't know what i watched that did the that started this but it decided that at least two-thirds of my advertising should be in spanish (laughs) and uh it was right around halloween a year two years ago and so there were a couple of horror movies coming out and all of the trailers for them would run in Spanish and all weirdly religious overtone possession horror stuff is immediately more badass the closer to Latin you can get with the language. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it didn't matter where in the where in the house I was. Uh, all of those movies are probably not scary and were total crap. I didn't I don't think I went and saw any of the piece B horror movies that were coming out that Halloween, but they sounded fucking rad in Spanish. Uh when you weren't expecting it. So yes, I agree. If you're going to do a creepy slow burn time travel show about missing kids, um, just leave it in German. (laughs) Well, uh, our last question comes to us from our buddy, Alec miracle, who says, my question is 
How are you guys? That's a that's a nice question. Uh, it's cold here, and I don't like it. Oh, I, I I was like, that is a nice question, but you are asking Randy, <laughs> and Randy gets super temperamental. Either the weather, or he looked on Twitter or something. I'm like, Randy, don't look at the news. Don't look at Twitter. Right before we're going to record, you I'm get cranky. fine. Is that what you want to hear? I'm fine. Everything's fine? It's fine. Les, how are you? Oh, I'm great. The world's a trash fire, and the western part of the U.S. is an actual fire, like a, a legitimate fire. Uh, but the rest of it's just a dumpster fire, and, and but I'm, I'm good. Grant, how are you? Warm from it. I'm generally okay. I'm okay. I'm kind of with you guys, but I'm okay. I don't want to... Let's just... Let's just take a break. <laughs> Watch some TV. Time, guys. Woohoo! All right, you guys ready to rock the news? Rock the news. Let's do this. All right, so this first story, uh, have you guys seen this? Have you heard about this? Have you seen this? Jordan Peele, you know, the guy from uh, from Key and Peele. And he, Keanu. And Keanu. Yep. Uh, he also had a movie that came out. Get out? Uh, no, I'm not going to get out yet. I'm going to finish what I'm th- saying. Get out! <laughs> That's not even funny. I'm sorry. That wasn't even funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Jordan Peele is going to be doing the Twilight Zone reboot, which is being greenlit over at CBS All Access. It's kind of exciting. If, and if you had said to me like six months ago, no, when did Get Out? If you, you said to me like a year ago, hey, Jordan Peele is going to do Get Out for CBS All Access. I would be like, oh, oh man. Twilight Zone. Rather. Twilight Zone. Yeah. yeah. I'd be like, oh, that's too bad. I like Jordan Peele. What a waste of his talent. What a... That's, that's, that's a terrible thing. Now I'm super excited because I've seen what CBS All Access does, and I've seen what Jordan Peele does with horror. I'm all about it. Honestly, if, if they'll pick smart like this, uh, they can keep this going with, with just adding a handful. You know, I mean, adding like one thing periodically if they'll keep picking smart. Um, Star Trek and this, uh, if they'll add one more thing, I would keep paying that. Yeah, well, you like the good fight too, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean – CBS All Access. I don't honestly even know what else is on CBS All Access, but it's worth it for Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, I wonder if um, Jordan Peele will act as like the the Rod Serling of this, and he'll also. That's narrate. what I was just thinking. Oh. Yeah, is he going to executive produce it and get another host, or is he going to? Yeah, it 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 doesn't really say what's going to happen so far. It does say that he's doing this in collaboration with producer Marco. Uh, Ramirez from the Defenders and X-Men, X-Men producer Simon Kinberg and uh, Ramirez who is showrunner for the Defenders on Netflix is going to uh, be the showrunner here Ooh. so uh, take that with a grain of salt because the Defenders was crap <laughs> now you gotta remember really bad yeah how much of the Defenders is down to Jeff Loeb being in charge of TV yeah I'm like can we really hold all of it against him yeah. if Jordan Peele wants to work with this guy that's that's good it's stuff something me, right? right yeah yeah <laughs> i'm kind of trusting in jordan peele's judgment I, i'm gonna i'm gonna put a lot of faith in jordan peele on this one. yeah let's see what happens yeah. Yeah. yeah so over on netflix well i mean we've kind of been uh, skipping the news or, or cutting down on some of the news stories lately and one of the big stories that we haven't really touched on too much is all of the terrible men in the world that are getting taken down on on different shows we've touched on it uh like jeffrey tambor over Mm -hmm. on transparent and the most recent one is that uh what's his name danny masterson danny masterson you might know him as hyde from the that 70s show he's been on a show with ashton kutcher once again over on netflix called the ranch but this guy's got not just one, not two, four allegations of rape. Yeah, this is not like a this is not like a touching kind of thing. This is rape. And I I 
I think I read that it's like tied to the Scientology church he's part of. Well, I don't know where those are, how those are he's related. He's being investigated. There are open cases with the LAPD. I mean, this is this is a much bigger deal. And yet they hadn't really talked about it much. And Netflix has been kind of quietly trying, hoping nobody noticed, I guess. Yeah, this has been coming for a little while. Like this is – these were in the paper a little while ago or some of them were. Um, and there's – some of these stories are really – in his case in particular, there are some people who crammed their own foot way down their throat on this. Yeah. Um, net, one of Netflix's reps, um, I think, was on the sideline of like a kid's soccer game uh-huh. and was talking to someone about these cases. And she said to the woman, uh, I just don't believe the four women. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually said. Yeah. No, I'm one of them. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And uh, and like this was a Netflix rep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was. There was someone else. Uh, oh, Masterson's publicist uh, is on an email exchange or a recorded phone call. One of the two um, talking with with one of the accusers, saying, or a, a friend of one of the accusers, saying, "I just don't believe it. They were dating at the time, so it it can't have been rape." Oh my god! <laughs> and apparently, what he's accused of is uh, specifically un- unconscious. Like whether you're dating him or not. Uh, knocking you out and oh, so like cosmic. point point is non consensual. Yeah. He... So anyway, at the very least, how the fuck is that show not canceled? And B, that show is god awful. <laughs> um, how the fuck was that show not already canceled? But but oh. I'm really glad that Netflix finally moved on this. Yeah, he's been yeah. fired and he's been written off the show. And this is yet again another one because you know they they have Kevin Spacey. Uh, being dropped off of House of Cards, but they are apparently greenlighting the sixth season of that show, and they had two episodes they had already filmed. So they're taking this at a cost, and they're still keeping the show going because I guess it's turned into the Claire show. Yeah, and I, I, I can understand the reasoning for keeping that potential of shifting the narrative of that show to have it end with her, a female, like ascending to the most powerful position yeah, honestly, there might be a narrative opportunity there for the show. Yeah, yeah. especially as, as creepier stuff. Like there was a, an article from, or thing from Gabriel Byrne about there was a work stoppage on uh, Usual Suspects, and he didn't know why at the time, but it was something space he did. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, well, another one of these stories that kind of falls in line with all of this is that uh, the Weinstein Company was producing a new show on Amazon which was a new David O. Russell show. Mm -hmm. And because Weinstein, all that shit went down with him, the show that was already like well into production got shut down. So now David O. Russell and his team are suing them uh, because of this. And I'm like, yeah, dude, right on. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Hurt the Weinstein company. You know that they were in some way complicit. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I... I cannot remember the name of the two writers. Uh, there were two female writers like a month ago that, that put an article out saying, hey, you know, we can now discuss this because non-disclosure is gone or something. Um, but they talked about having had their first show that should have been on the air in 2005. Mm-hmm. Then they got all the way through, like, into production on it. And the lead actor had a rape charge against got a rape charge against him and, the, and was pulled from the show. And it killed the show. Yeah. yeah. And... So there was, and there was no talk of recasting. Like it, it. They they were they were talking about it now to make the point of like, just because you take one of these men men's names off of one of these shows, that why why would that kill the show? That shouldn't kill the show. Money can flow into that hole, you know, like that spot where that producer should have been. Um, that don't fall into this weird Hollywood trap or, or weird world trap of. Oh, the man's name's not attached anymore. You know, Harvey Weinstein's name's not attached anymore. So, ergo, the project evaporates. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, they don't get to just wipe your hands of it. <laughs> yeah, well, like that's hundreds of people's fucking jobs. Someone step in. I think that's the big adjustment we may be seeing in in 2018. Hopefully, it may take longer than that. But the notion of this stuff is going to keep happening, and you can't blame the victims for coming forward. And you don't want the victims to have to balance the calculus. I mean, it's a monstrous. They have to balance the calculus of, well, I'm going to cast cost hundreds of people their jobs who had nothing to do with this. You can't ask that of anyone. And so, yeah, there has to be a way for things to go forward without these people. Like, look at better things. 
which I mean, that one, that's a bad example because it's Louis C.K. is all over that. Like he's co-writes, he's producing. But like that show just went on a sudden hiatus. And there's a lot of people employed on that show. There's a lot. I mean, there's cast and crew who had nothing to do with it. One Mississippi. Yeah. That Louis C.K. produced. I mean, you there has to be a way to get these guys out and have the show continue on without them, without destroying it. Andrew Kreisberg is is half the writing credit on all of those Earth X crossovers. Yeah. which sucks watching his name on those right yes, now, knowing that he's he should be out of that. It, it was part of it was the male writing staff's job on those fucking shows to like run a fence between him and the women. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but he's half the producer with Greg Berlanti. He's half the product like producer team, and he's half the writing team, like principal credit on the writing. Um. So he's gone off those shows. I, I'm glad that I'm not hearing any discussion of does the Arrowverse pack up and leave, you know? Right. Like, I mean, I, I'm hoping that something doesn't come out about Greg Berlanti and it like kill four fucking shows. <laughs> um, but I would hope that it just wouldn't, I mean, go find people who just aren't scumbag predators to yeah. take these jobs. Yeah. Bring other people in, replace them. Change the Weinstein name from that yeah. company. All of that should just like immediately happen. Like, really glad to hear that they're <laughs> suing over that because, yeah, that is something he did, and he should that that's a damage from it. Well, that's yeah. and that's the interesting thing. They have there's all kinds of insurance on shows. You know, if somebody dies or something like that goes wrong, we may start to see things built into contracts where if you are accused of a crime, you lose your back end, you lose all your money, and then and then they could put that to someone else. I mean, that they may have to start planning for this kind of thing. Mm. Which means that, hey, there's consequences for it, which is kind of the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> on that uplifting note, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back to talk about our shows. Alright guys, so the first show that we're going to discuss over on Netflix, the second season of Easy is here, and I have not watched even the first season, but <laughs> I, I know that you both have been checking this out. Uh, go ahead. Alright, so I watched, I, I realized when I went to watch Easy Season 2 that I had not seen all of Easy, uh, I had not seen all of Easy Season 1. I only I stopped watching. I watched. I spot watched a few episodes. And That's I right. You only watched that threesome episode, and you <laughs> watched and it over four again. times. Yeah, it was very weird. <laughs> Bakuchi and uh, Orlando Bloom episode. Yeah, the, uh, Malin Ackerman. Yeah, I just watched that over and over on repeat silently. It was weird. Um, I just I come in. I come into the TV dudes. I just I I put it on the studio. I just kind of leave it running as a background thing. Is that is that weird? Is that weird? Please no. never release that podcast. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> anyway, no. I watched. I think about half of them, and I and I. It wasn't my thing, and I and I thought it was weird. Like there were like no stakes in the stories, and I liked them all well enough. I liked the people in it, but it just didn't do anything for me. So I wasn't excited to watch the season two. You love having just like different types of meat in shows. Yeah, I Not do. Not enough stakes. Not enough stakes. Yeah, or or chops. <laughs> and uh, I really just ruined your flow <laughs> with that dumb joke. <laughs> that's our that's our model. That's I had our, to wedge our, that in. That's our thing. Make a wedge salad. Wedge, God damn it, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> so. I uh, but I started. I watched the first three, and I kind of fell in love with this show. Grant, uh, Les, you said something similar, right? Yes, I, I've only watched the first two of this season, and I've, I kind of. I mean, season one was uneven, was how I felt about it last time, um, because, like you said, there each one was a different vignette of kind of different people. Mm -hmm. um, it started to feel like high maintenance for me. The, yeah. the the web show that got picked up by HBO only those interconnect heavily. Like you really see those people blend into the background and it becomes this game to thread the high maintenance episodes together. But Easy didn't lean on that. And and so consequently, like you watched a slice of life that was enjoyable enough, but then it didn't feel like it moved. I mean, I didn't I didn't then follow those people next. You know, it, it just didn't lean on it enough. Somehow this season returning to it 
I had a moment of like, fuck, do I remember what any of that was about outside of a couple of, you know, plot, like rough plot outlines of a couple of the, the cuter episodes. And I started watching it and it was like checking in on, on, on friends of like, Oh shit. Yeah. I remember this couple. Yeah. Uh, like, Oh cool. It's, you know, uh, the second episode is a married couple from, I think the, the first episode. The I'd first, episode. first episode. Yeah. yeah and I'd, I'd forgotten them until we saw them again. Yeah. yeah. And, and it starts with them opening up their marriage, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, the other show she's got to have it also does a, t- a take on polyamory uh, in theory and it f- absolutely belly flops at it <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss it in a moment but um easy handles it deftly and with this amazing tenderness and really funny like having ju- I, I watched she's got to have it in a in a binge to push through it and then i watched uh, the first two episodes of easy and i was shocked at that second episode of like Oh shit! Here's similar relationship stuff to what she's got to have. It was trying to handle, but but done right and done well. And I care about these people, and that's really tender and real. Yeah, the the thing I was watching this with uh, with a friend, and we were talking about it, and I was griping about how the conflicts are kind of low. There's not like a lot of heavy conflict, and she pointed out she's like, no, it's it's kind of like real life. Like there are conflicts, but nothing blows up. There's not big Seinfeldian moments or anything. There's like you know we see the wife dealing with the fact that she has sex with someone else. And then she's maybe not as okay with it as she thought she might be, but it doesn't turn to a big blow up. It's just sort of a thing that sits with her for a little bit. And we'll probably I don't know that actress's name, but she walks an amazing line in that. I know that scene you're talking about. Like she really walks an amazing line of like, do you regret that? Or do you, do you like what? Yeah. yeah. There's this weird, like doesn't regret it, but isn't entirely okay. And then, them curling up together afterwards was just an amazing little bit of acting in the first episode, uh, Aubrey Plaza. Um, it, it's a neighborhood watch that goes over the top mm-hmm. and Aubrey Plaza is the wife through the whole, as the neighborhood setting up the neighborhood watch going, y'all are being paranoid assholes. Yeah. 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 Don't do this. Don't do this. This is going to go wrong. You're being weird. And it then goes wrong. Uh, and then ironically she ends up, being a per like being the neighbor that actually stops a, a thief yeah and uh and again it, it like you said the stakes aren't high uh she is genuinely mad at her husband for organizing this mm-hmm. but it at no point is she moving out or is he on the cat like uh it, it's aubrey plaza so there's an amazing moment where she's laying there looking at him in bed and they're both you know, heads on pillows and he goes, is this really going to be a thing? Are you really mad? And she goes, I'm not mad. <laughs> and it's, it is one of the most married, like, Oh shit, dude, she's so mad. You should really deal with this. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that, uh, the show is so delightfully real. Like the, it, um, it doesn't feel art of it's, it just feels really beautifully done in a way that, that, uh, Joe Swansburg is that, yeah, just just Swanberg. He, he, I think he writes and directs all of them. Yeah, right. Direction and his movies don't like Drinking Buddies, and I think it's one of his movies. They don't always work for me. They're they're just meandering mumblecore. I don't know. On an hour and a half movie, they don't sustain for me. In vignettes, it works shockingly well. I was I watched I wound up watching all all the episodes, and when I started seeing familiar faces of things that i saw from the synopsis like the two brothers who are brewing beer or the that's why i can't wait to see where, where the brewery is now and that's what that's when i caught myself going oh man now i want now i want to watch the episode where i catch up with this character and that's what i realized I, even though i hadn't watched the episodes i knew the the synopsis and some of them I had watched the episodes but i i realized about halfway through watching this it's like oh what i thought was a bunch of unconnected vignettes in fact what we're watching is like eight series that have different lead characters every season and each episode is in a season. So it's like it's episode two happens a season later for eight different shows. And and they all sort of interconnect. There's some background characters that connect like in the, uh, the escort who meets their client and there's, and that when the Nigerian cab driver shows up again, which he does later, there's some great stuff. It's like just little bits of like, Oh, that character from this thing. And yeah, he's building a little world. And I, I didn't, I didn't see it. And now I see it. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, season two really capitalizes on season one in a fully unexpected way for me. I, I'm very happy with uh, with Easy and can't wait to watch the rest of it. Yeah, same. Uh, She's got to have it, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's go ahead and jump over to She's Got to Have It. So this has ten episodes, I believe. Yeah. 
and I only managed to get through four of them so far. But you guys both finished it, correct? Yeah, oh, shit, it was still pretty good when you stopped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was watching this, and I was like, "This show's uh, not too bad." In fact, I, I liked the first three episodes. The fourth one, I thought it was a little bit eh, meandering. Yeah, the the longer it goes on, the more you start to realize that the character at the center of it is a narcissistic mess. Yeah, and then you start to put together that earlier things that you thought were it they weren't character growth and then you start to see the structural flaws in it as the show goes on and it starts to lose its own thread yeah uh, there's a review of this on uh dazed i think dazed digital.com and dazed magazine i i was googling around for reviews after i finished watching it and uh and there was this article just just nailed all of the things i think it's called like everything it does wrong yeah um it's not just that okay it's a remake of a spike lee movie uh, of one of his first movies. Right. And, uh, and in interviews, Spike Lee talks about regrets of his career. And one of the scenes in the movie, if she's got to have it is, is the regret of his career. Um, the character of Greer in the movie. Um, and I have not seen, I, I saw part of the movie when it first came out, when I was a redneck ass town in Northeast Texas. And it was so not made for me that I didn't watch it in fucking junior high or whatever. <laughs> um, so I have not gone back and rewatched this, but apparently the character of Greer in the movie forces himself on Nola Darling uh, in a in a rape scene. Mm. And the rape scene is the big regret of Lee's career. After that, in the plot, she goes on to date him, uh. then cheats on him. Uh, all of this is supposedly in service of a theme of destroying monogamy when it's really just a fucked up, damaged story. Yeah. Um, so so I get that he's trying to correct this thing on, on this show. Um, and, and update it, but I don't feel like it's updated so much as it is couched in the hot new thing, which apparently is to, uh, call shit Polly and shoehorn it in casual did a weird episode yeah. or a few episodes. Um, I feel like it's, it's this weird buzz thing now. Um, yeah, it's the new trend. It's the new trend. And yeah. I, I also feel like maybe groundbreaking, like the way the show marketed itself, like groundbreaking show about uh, black feminist woman free, you know, owning her sexuality and not being ashamed. And, um, she announces herself as a polyamorous pansexual free woman in this compulsive, like braggadocio manner. Um, maybe that didn't need to be written by an insanely rich man. Well, now he did bring in specifically brought in a lot more female writers because he didn't want this to be a dude's voice. Yeah. There's some of the episodes that are still written by him and yeah. the whole thing. Is so, None of the characters actually touch each other, for starters. Like, I mean, they they are not actually interconnected characters. She has a friend that she is in no way a friend to that does not share any scene where they really connect with her life. The friend is instead used as this fucked up body image allegory that is played for laughs like Marvin getting shot in the back of the car. Yeah. And I have no idea whether I'm supposed to laugh at that or not, but it's at the end of one of the most awkwardly fucked up long dance scenes – but the show isn't making a larger point about how people are complicated. It's it's not dealing with any of the characters enough to do that. Most of the characters are wandered off an improv stage one note jokes. Yeah. Uh, I think Winnie Wynn has to be a real person. Like that dude's name's got to be Winnie Wynn. He's not an actor, clearly. <laughs> uh, but I don't know what the fuck that's about. Uh, <laughs> this thing is – it feels more like – Noah Baumbach or Squid and the Whale or um, for whatever realness it's trying to go for, it full on slips into playwright sound very frequently in, a, in an Aaron Sorkin, David Mamet level of pretension. Like like Wynton Marcellus is supposed to give Spike Lee an award for this show at the Met. <laughs> yeah, that I totally agree with that. It's fucking show like this is. Yeah, this is Wes Anderson's Dear White People, man. Like this is so <laughs> tweet, uh, and and I'm sorry, but like there's a fucked up dream sequence where Jamie is choosing between him and his wife. It gets really lyrical and poetic. Like he says a bunch of shit straight to the camera, literally as if it is not the most banal problem on the planet that this man is having problems choosing between his wife and his mistress. You are not the first fucking person to come up with this problem, dude. Like is, this is not a stop the show and have a poetic fourth wall break moment to the camera, yeah. Uh, and then have a dream sequence out of nowhere that at no point has the show set up the language for this dream sequence to make any sense. 
So it just takes a minute of like, where are you people? How are these characters in a room together suddenly? How are you in these clothes? Oh, this isn't really happening. Yeah. And then there's also, I mean, there's the Spike Lee clearly was very proud of his music. And that whole gig where that whole gimmick where he shows up where, the, where we see the the album cover, like I don't I, mind that so much, but it gives it a Snoopy cartoon pacing for the fucking thing. Yeah. Well, to me, it just felt like Spike Lee talking down to his audience is like, "Hey, check out this music. You should like it. You should go find it. Look how good I am at music." And I feel like that's what this whole thing was. There are whole sequences of language and 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 slang and everything that I know are are speaking a cultural language that is not for me and not not aimed at my cultural background. Um, but the show's so inept at its handling of symbolism and themes and even staying consistent in the language that it's trying to tell its story in that I really don't have any reason to believe that those parts are done any better. I, I really have to feel like even the, the long monologues that are, that are clearly like beautifully lyrically written monologues, like I, I'm not certain that they're not super heavy handed, like, uh, like hearing somebody try to use all the slang at once or something, you know? Yeah. The way that Jamie's character like tries to keep speaking and they call it out on him. Like he keeps speaking hood, like the way he was raised. It's weird. It, it's jarringly fucked up. And then they have an artist, a uh, white guy character that's covered in tats and has the same kind of grill as Mars or similar grill. And he's so thin as a character I can't tell if we're supposed to laugh at him as a he, – he can't be real. He's pure stereotype joke. But if you're going to make jokes like that, then you undercut your ability to have real characters elsewhere in the show. Like everybody becomes this Commedia archetype joke. Um, and then just boiling down, Nola's a terrible fucking person. Yeah, that's a that's the biggest problem. And she never learns. Her bullshit to her therapist is such bullshit. Yeah, and it's it's not that you can't have characters who are. I mean, I love you're the worst, and they're narcissistic monsters. But it's comedy for one thing, and it doesn't want us to sympathize with them. It wants us to sympathize with them as human beings, but we're not supposed to sympathize with their behavior. Whereas I feel like in a lot of this, we're supposed to be like, oh yeah, Nola's doing the right thing. She's she's bohemian. Look how hip she is. And I'm like. The thing she does at the end in that finale, like that is that is awful. It's an awful thing to do to put someone. Wait, to, what does to... she do? She she invites all three of her guys to a Thanksgiving dinner at the same time, and she doesn't tell any of them. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't yeah. give any of them. She doesn't have the courtesy to give to tell any of them. This. Yeah, so oh, it's a... that that these other guys are the guys I'm also seeing. Well, no, that that she reveals it at the same. She's like she basically one of them shows up thinking he's having Thanksgiving with her. Mm-hmm. Then the doorbell rings. Another one shows up. Then the doorbell rings. Another one shows up, and then she says, "Oh, by the way, you're all the people I'm dating. Let's all have dinner." Like, in what world is that a good idea? It's an ambush. It's it's unethical, and she's mean for doing it. And she ambushes them to break up with all of them at once. Yeah. Basically, yeah, it's it's monstrous behavior. I, I was. I was really things keep happening to her as if she is growing, yeah. and, but she is not growing. And moreover, you start to realize that no character actually connects to her in a way that could teach her to grow. Everybody either just pats her on the back. Where the hell does the homeless guy who apparently also went to college with her and is also a vet? Yeah, what happened to that guy? Clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I that watched so many fucking problems. I only watched the beginning of this, and I was agreeing with you guys about like how refreshing it was to see a character like her, yeah, like own her femininity, own her her sexual empowerment, and like know herself and know what she wants. Yeah. And by the fourth episode, when she goes on a man cleanse and she starts the um, relationship. With uh, her lesbian friend Opal, with Opal, yeah, and, and she's worse to Opal than any of the guys, even. Yeah, she starts. It, it starts like revealing how kind of uh, manipulative and abusive she is, mm-hmm. and now hearing like that's the direction the rest of the show goes in. Yeah. It's kind of disappointing with with how it started and like her voice, the dialogue in the beginning. Yeah, like I, I disagree with you, Randy. I really appreciate like Spike Lee's style, how he gives. Brooklyn's such a character and makes that like interweave with the plot. How he also interweaves the music and shows the album art there as like a uh, as a scene break between each one. And I'm like, yeah. I, I like how it, it's all synced up to music in a way, and like that's just a very playful style. But in the hashtag things weren't working for me. It all yeah. felt really 
like that trend is already passe to me yeah. and it just feels like old people trying to be hip or something to mm-hmm. me like don't, don't. so grant the lat in the like episode six and seven i think there are uh songs that stop the scene and there's a whole scene where the song plays and the lyrics go by on the screen yeah. in a in a low contrast font that's hard to fucking read <laughs> and uh and then I think it's episode seven or eight ends with like six minutes of a music video, her, a damn a music, music video. video. But it's but it's not even a good. It's just her sitting on like a turning stool so that she's perfectly turning and she keeps flipping between her and two outfits so that like she blips between like an all white outfit and like a, a patterned out like yeah. shirt or blouse. And that's and, and it's, like I fast forward like it's it it just does that to a song while lyrics go by behind her in case you don't get it uh for for like six minutes yeah that's that's kind of where i'm that's it's not that i think he he's great at using music that like the music choices are good and that kind of thing it's the hey get it get it that that's the thing that drives me Starts crazy hammering over your head yeah. and the, the gimmick becomes too much yes so. uh, yeah yeah i was really annoyed with the show and then <laughs> yeah. i watched easy right afterwards and was like yeah oh easy. wow so you could handle this subject matter like intimately and beautifully yeah i think that's that's one thing i definitely noticed easy it handled the same kind of things like a lot of this the same kind of polyamory um racial issues all of that kind of stuff and handle it much more deftly than anything that this she's got to have did and here's the other thing she's got to have it suffers from insecure having already come out and been great i was about to say so in the past year i've watched insecure chewing gum has come out uh even if you, if you want to talk about a shitty person learning some lessons girl boss was better mm-hmm. uh Hell, dear white people, which you mentioned is great, but this this the the problem it has is Spike Lee expects to be like the the original voice, and he's he's late, and he doesn't have as much to say as you would think. This is definitely not fixing his woman woman it, problem. It started it started off so promising. Yeah, it's, it did. It's sad to hear it. It, just it starts off. It started off looking interesting, and then as as it went on, I hated it more and more. Well, yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather watch Fleabag again. Or oh, Fleabag is so fun. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, let's jump over to Search Party over on TBS because the second season uh, is out now, and it's six episodes into its uh, ten episode season. I think they're doing two episodes a week, so it seems like they're just like really trying to offload it. It's mm-hmm. kind of weird, but that's odd. <laughs> this show, I love it. I love these characters so much, and they are all they're they're. They're all a mess. <laughs> I don't understand your. I you've talked about liking this show, so I decided I was going to start from season one. I was uh-huh. going to like. I was going to try and dig into it. I got seven episodes in. I watched seven episodes of this show. I do not like it. Oh no, no, I don't understand the affection. Did you I, watch this new season? No, I didn't watch any of it. I didn't get to oh, it. Oh, okay. So, so I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't like it. I don't find it funny. I don't like any of the characters. I did not like this show. Um, uh, Les, what do you think? <laughs> I liked season one. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't love it nearly as much as you. Um, I was looking forward to starting season two, but I haven't watched any of season two yet. Oh, okay. I want to well, hear. I want to hear your thoughts because I, I. It did not get me. Well, the show takes a twist, Randy, at the okay. end of the first season when the Ron Livingston character, uh, what's her name, uh, Dory, she perceives that he's actually like this kind of creeper threat. And she and uh, her boyfriend murder him, basically. Oh, okay. Well, he comes and attacks him, and, and she tries to defend herself, and then he goes and, like, helps defend her, and, and it's, but it's not really, it wasn't an attack, it was all, like, th- her paranoia, whatever, they kill him. <laughs> and then the next season is them dealing with the fact that they killed someone, like, they all, all four of them get brought in to kind of help, like, clean up the mess and, like, hide the body, and... They could have at any point gone to the cops and probably been okay, but they kept digging themselves a hole, dig worse and worse and worse, and leaving clues everywhere about what they did. And, like, it all is just becoming so much that, like, the tensions there, they're, they're privileged hipster obliviousness to so much um, is just such a hilarious contrast that you just see how – this problem keeps getting exacerbated. Uh, the the guy, uh, the her, her gay buddy who's writing the book that he's a, he's a habitual liar. Mm-hmm. Um, 
he's having a mental breakdown <laughs> like during this, but he's not like he's in complete denial of it. And he, uh, the scenes where he starts losing his hair and um, like in a meeting, it was just like the best punchline for him bragging about everything that's great about him. And then it's like, nope, everything's fucked up right there. There, uh, He's got a book deal with this company based upon how he was living a life um, lying to people that he had cancer. And what's so funny about this to me is that now he's lying to the book deal people about every step of the way. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's what would inevitably happen with that type of relationship. I, I just find that um, I really like the dynamic between the characters. I I think whereas it's a very similar demographic that Girls was catering to, mm-hmm. this is showing why those people actually are terrible. Whereas <laughs> girls was trying to glorify that culture okay this is like this is that culture and these people are rotten but in in some way they're they're so stupid that i'm kind of rooting for them (laughs) because they just keep digging themselves a a bigger hole and i don't know i mean i always find the the stories go pretty quickly and i find them very amusing Hmm, okay i just it it never it never made me laugh well, it's a dark comedy. It's, yeah. it's supposed to be dark. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It just it never quite clicked for me. And I like Ron Livingston. I like Aaliyah Shawcat, but never grabbed me. Ah, unless you you felt a little bit more positive, but not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I I liked the first season, uh, but it I, I don't know. It didn't. I was I don't know. Maybe I I had heard that it was just fucking great from like you and a couple other people. Uh, I think only me. <laughs> like I don't know if I was expecting like it to just bowl me over, and it it I kind of found myself going, I don't like any of you. Like it, it took a little while for me to get into it because I really don't like any of the characters. Yeah. Uh, like I I want to see more shit happen to them. I have a hard time with with shows where I kind of want everybody to get punched. <laughs> but. But you guys love You're the Worst. I mean, I feel like in a way from what I saw of You're the Worst. This felt very similar to me. I have an affection for the other worst characters, though. All of them, I feel like they're all bad people in a lot of ways. But with the exception of maybe Lindsay, I feel like I want them all. I want them all to get better. I, I want Gretchen and Jimmy to work things out, and and I want I want them to stop destroying people's lives. Um, I'd agree with that. I don't know why, and re- literally based on everything else I watch, uh, I, I can't figure out why i like you're the worst (laughs) i shouldn't on paper on paper that show should drive me just as crazy as i think i think it's the quality of the writing the quality acting on that show it it elevates it well there's a definite i love gatherings Uh, (laughs) there's a definite shift in uh tone and in threat that's going on i guess tension Mm -hmm. in the second season that i think even if you might have waffled a little bit on what the first season was this has a lot more of uh, a compelling through line that I think episode to episode, it continues to escalate. And I'm much more impressed by how all of this ties together narratively than I was in the first season. So maybe yeah. maybe that's a bigger selling point. Cool. Uh, okay, well, let's jump over to Crisis on Earth X. And yes. you guys, uh, you guys can take that away because I didn't watch this. So I've, I'm behind on. I have not watched any of the DC, DC shows this season. I watched the first episode of Flash, and I think, er, and everything but Arrow. I watched the first episode of, and then I sort of fell off of it. Um, but I came back to this because it's the four part crossover, and I feel like I might just watch the crossovers from now on because this was sort of the perfect encapsulation of everything I want these shows to be. Yeah, they. They've, I mean, I've, I've loved the crossovers every year. They're, they've been fun, and I'm glad they've kept doing them. Um, for me, it felt like they got it right this year. The yeah. last year was the first time that they included Supergirl. I think that they had Supergirl to include. Yeah. Um, and and the they did it on four nights, uh, if I remember right. And and Supergirl's night, literally her stinger. Uh, I mean, just her stinger at the end uh, was the only bit that Crawley like, had a breach of basically like. Right, you know, the right after the credit or right before the credits, uh, yeah. a breach opened and like Barry or somebody stepped out and went, "We need you," and that was it. Yeah, it was essentially a three-part crossover. Yeah, yeah, and everybody was like, I, "Why did you advertise that?" I wouldn't have. I mean, a lot of people, I don't think, would have sat through Supergirl necessarily uh, <laughs> that week. But this year, they did it in two nights in two like 
like two two hour chunks. Yep, and that was the way to and go. It was great. Like you got you got like an hour and a half movie both nights basically um, with commercials. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, the other thing, they all they centered it on Barry and Iris's wedding, which is a good emotional hook, and that's a good reason to bring everybody together. They, and it's a classic comic book setup. Oh, for sure. A big, I mean, comic books do those a lot. Their uh, their premise of using evil doppelgangers let uh, Stephen Amell and well, not just Stephen Amell, but but especially Stephen Amell and um, Supergirl, whose name I'm blanking on, uh, Melissa, Melissa Benoist, uh, Melissa Benoit, Melissa Benoist, Benoit, yeah, Benoit. They really got to play around as the evil versions themselves. They got to have a lot of fun with it, and it let Harry, you know, it let uh, Harry Wells be Harry Wells' evil, evil doppelganger again. Yeah, and Tom Cavanaugh fun. just loves chewing the scene as as many Harry Wells as he can be. And, and he got to meet you, Lord Thawne. And so it was, it was a great, it was a great setup, and it was a lot, a lot of fun to play with. And whenever you're in duplicates, you can do things where, like, suddenly, Win is the general of the resistance on the other world. You can introduce the Ray. You can bring back Captain Cold as the gay lover of the Ray, who is a weirdly like noble hero and completely unlike his uh, doppelganger, Citizen Cold. Citizen Cold, yeah, yeah. And he is now on Legends, so they've now gotten to add Leo Snart back to Legends, which is great. And so. It, it all and the, I thought they did a great job with the storyline. They they gave everybody a character arc, whether it was the Firestorm stuff, which I thought landed pretty well, even though I think they've mucked up that character pretty badly. Yeah, um, I don't know what they're doing. With, there is no Firestorm now currently. Yeah, but I thought that the emotional arc landed pretty well, which is which was good because I, I wasn't sure. And I was it got care. it got uh, Victor Gerber. Yeah, his actor's name. I knew he was leaving the show, and so I, I it was just kind of a matter of how are they going to do it. Yeah. yeah. But they gave they gave him a good finale. They they sent him off in a good way. Um, they made me care about the relationship between him and Jax in a way that I didn't think I really would. Uh, they really did some good stuff with um, Iris and uh, Felicity, sort of the behind the scenes about their relationships with Barry and with Ollie. Like there was a lot of meat to this, and it was also a fun story of superheroes punching Nazis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they got to just, I mean, really knock it out of the park on that. Like Earth X is fun. I mean. Better than the Dominators, uh, yeah. of like an eight alien invasion uh, or whatever, 10 aliens tops that they brought. Yeah. Uh, this really worked. Like the dystopia was a was a blast. Uh, like you said, it, it just it all it all worked. I, I enjoyed the hell out of the Earth X crossovers. I have been keeping up with these shows except for Arrow, which I just can't do. Um, so it was kind of nice to like, oh, hey, it's all the Arrow guys. Neat. Um Flash and it was a nice kind of break from everybody's seasons. They've, I, I've now watched the, they've all had one more finale, like their mid-season finale right after that. Right. Uh, Flash's villain this season is the Thinker, and that's been, that's been really fun. Uh, so it was kind of cool to see him take a break from it and then come back. Uh, I'm just thrilled that the villain's not a fucking speedster. <laughs> uh, but, but like seeing Supergirl. Uh, and everybody kind of get to fight their doppelgangers and take a break from their seasons and everything has been really fun. Um, in Legends particularly, this had ramifications, though, because like I said, they added back Snart. So you've got Captain Cold back with, with Mick, which that character's been through so much change mm -hmm. since the, the start of it that it's really neat to see them paired back up now. Um, separately, they immediately in the next Legends episode uh, run into young Victor Stein. Oh, uh -huh. And and it doesn't – they don't add him to the team. Like it doesn't – they don't replace him or anything. Like at first I thought, oh, they're going to go – like y'all are going to form Firestorm or something. But that's not where they go, but it's a, it's a neat epilogue hmm. okay. of, of watching everyone on the ship deal with like being around him and seeing him. Yeah, this this reminded me of what I liked about all of these shows, even Arrow, which I haven't watched for a while. I, it reminded me why I once was a big fan and made me want to go back. If if TV was not so full of stuff to watch, I would probably go back and watch at least Legends of Tomorrow to see how this paid out and probably Supergirl because I really like Supergirl. But like I, I thought this was sort of the, the perfect distillation of what the Berlantiverse does well. And I, I thought they did that in a way that the, the invasion, the Dominator story did not do. So I was very happy with it. I also watched uh, Justice League in the theaters the same week. Um, and, I mean, obviously this was going to be more fun. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hate the Justice League movie the way a, a portion of the nerd population did, but it's. I still came away from it going, wow, uh, Earth X had 
a couple of moments that were just as badass as this, <laughs> that's that's not all right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As a, as a fan, that's not all right. Y'all managed <laughs> to, to, you know, you, you could have got this done with the CW. So you guys could have thrown like a day's budget at the CW and I'd have got the greatest fucking week of TV of my life. Uh, and we could have skipped this. That's that's the thing though. Fox. Fox is the best. You only need <laughs> I mean C C W. Yeah, Disney. <laughs> that's crazy that's happening. Yep. Good? Bad? Yeah, uh, bad. Very bad. But but at least we might get some X Men crossovers. Fantastic Four. Yeah, I don't I don't care about the rest of the world now. Everything's bad. It's <laughs> gonna be great when we have the Fantastic Four movie in the theaters, part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We will all be able to use our uh, our Disney chits, which will be given by the Overlord One World Government that Disney's gonna run mm-hmm. uh, to go see that movie before working for Disney for whatever pet- pittance wages they pay us, uh, and to pay all hail to the Lord Mouse. Wait, I'm gonna have a job. Uh, Sweet job ish. Sweet, sort nope. of more slave labor kind of thing. I'm taking it. Uh, a job's a job. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> Why, Randy? Because he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We are out for the week, and we'll be back. Uh, we're recording our best of the year. Best of the year uh, this weekend. So uh, I don't know when we're going to release that. We might release it probably during uh, Christmas week. But uh, I was thinking February. <laughs> <laughs> way late but uh, uh I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, it's gonna be fun to it's gonna be fun we got our tv dudes top 10 put together yeah all right les thank you randy thanks thanks grant and until next week tv dudes out run podcast and a member of the permanent record podcast network we are exclusively listener supported if you'd like to help us out please go to patreon.com slash tv dudes you can like us on facebook and twitter at tv dudes and help us out on itunes by giving us a five-star rating and writing a review to find out more about us go to the tv dudes.com and permanent i'm grant davis thanks for listening